Yeah, uh, actual uh, Alpha Scramble. I'll do this uh, 3 1 3 out. Your uh, Scramble, Alpha Scramble, 2 times 40. Check the southbound, uh, low level media bar, interrogation uh, for uh, a small uh, aircraft. Uh, This was exercise teamwork, a complex land, sea, and air pattern of men, aircraft, and ships, moving to a master plan devised more than two years earlier by a group of NATO naval experts at the Command HQ in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, gentlemen, you've all read the political background leading up to teamwork. I propose at this time that we consider the initial disposition of uh, units and ships. Is StarTech still scheduled for... On StarTech, as the first day of an exercise is called, the Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic moved into his strategic direction center with all forces mobilized, grouped, and ready. The planners knew that the exercise would end 14 days later and 5,000 miles away, when Allied landing forces would link up with the Norwegian troops they had come to reinforce. And that, of course, in turn depends on... Um, the, the and as these Allied reinforcements moved east, they would pass under control of NATO's other Supreme Allied Command, the headquarters of the commander of Allied Forces Europe, in short, Sakur. Working on his own series of autumn forge maneuvers, Sacker had ordered his staff to integrate the closing European end of teamwork into his overall strategic planning. Near London at Northwood, the third of NATO's top military commanders, Commander-in-Chief Channel, shares with Sackland the job of keeping open the sea lanes between Europe and North America and the supply and reinforcement of Sacker. That area, sir. From Norfolk, Virginia, Sackland had ordered his strike fleet to sea. Well, when the SK puts to sea on day minus seven, where will Sunday fall on then? Well, present plans show them concentrating off Portland. On the eastern side of this same Atlantic Command, Sackland holds ready a group of destroyer-type ships, known as the Standing Naval Force Atlantic, Stanav Forland. This force from eight member countries is the first permanent multinational naval squadron in history. Back on shore, reserve units are called in to join the team. Thank you. A school teacher when not on duty, Helen McLean is part of an all-reservist unit, the Naval Control of Shipping, a complex system of management exercised over millions of square miles of ocean. And if the Alliance was ever attacked, the only way to give merchant shipping the convoy protection it would need. Captain Cox and Lieutenant Birkeman, Naval Air Officer. Thank you very much. You have the radio for Captain Blair. Viking Victory, Captain Moller. Ships specially chartered from several nations gather in an English Channel port. Their skippers and radio operators, integrated with escort officers, will become a single compact and disciplined team, ready and able to obey orders given by the convoy commander in response to threats that may develop. Check again, all radars are in good working order. Radar. Yeah, you are sailing, my boy.
On the other side of the Atlantic, a second fast convoy has been formed. And in Halifax, an officer of the Canadian Armed Forces prepares to lead them to Weymouth, England, through mock attacks from ships, aircraft, and above all, submarines. We've heard that the threat to our passage is initially from submarine attacks in the western Atlantic with attack from aircraft and missiles as we move eastward. This ally is dipping sonar that listens for submarines underwater. It is used on escort ships that carry their own helicopters. Here, a Canadian destroyer. Long-range maritime patrol aircraft, American, Canadian, German, Dutch, Norwegian, or here, British, play a major part in this essentially defensive pattern. They watch over Allied merchant and combat ships, and also log the large number of Soviet units that come to observe and to listen. Like a Cresta cruiser, with missiles that can sink ships 30 miles away. A white-topped electronic intelligence craft recording radio and radar traffic and overflying the British carrier Ark Royal, a Soviet bear escorted by a U.S. Navy Tomcat. In mid-ocean, Stanav Forland is ready to rendezvous with the fast Halifax Weymouth convoy. Beginning day nine, the multinational NATO squadron will be responsible for its safe escort during the last half of the week-long Atlantic run. The convoys are now well underway, and attention turns to the U.S.-U.K. Carrier Strike Force, meeting up in Scottish waters to support and to shield the amphibious fleet grouping in Scapa Flow. Can we move on to the assembly of the forces at Scapa Flow? Uh, yes, the U.S. element uh, will assemble there. 14 ships and plus five. That means that they're all... When could we expect a strike fleet to be prepared on plan 203, please? Under Sackland's command, the entire force makes ready. Marines on their troop transports and landing ships. And on strike carriers, the aircraft and their pilots. As this force heads north into the Norwegian Sea, the planners know that its flank would be exposed to a naval sortie out of the Baltic. Threat coming out of the Baltic. 
Well, I think Commander Naval Forces Baltic approaches would provide barrier submarines in an observation role. 30 meters, hold steady. Units of the Federal German Republic are in position to ward off any threat. A group of their landing craft playing the enemy is spotted by a submarine in observation, and the alarm is given. Besatzung auf Manöverstation. Aircraft fly out to photograph everything in the area. Once the targets have been identified and presumed neutralized, these units end their part in the teamwork story to begin national exercises on firing ranges out to sea. Alarm! Besatzung auf Gefechtsstation! Power 601, your target, the most northerly ship of the force. Watcher, got it on my gadget, out. Seeziel on Steuerbord, Richtung 20, Entfernung 50. With the Baltic threat eliminated, the U.S.-U.K. carrier strike fleet prepares to support amphibious landings on the Norwegian coast. On board Kennedy, there are 10 briefing rooms for the pilots of more than 90 aircraft. Like 30-ton bombs, the fully fueled twin jets are catapulted from standstill to subsonic in two seconds. Even without an enemy, a dangerous occupation that keeps highly skilled men at constant risk, as here. When a Tomcat fighter warms up, a throttle jams, and the two-man crew must save themselves. Before ejecting, the pilot swung his aircraft out of the waiting line and over the side. The crew parachuted back to the flight deck with only minor injuries. Two minutes later, aircraft were taking off again. Headquarters ship like the USS Mount Whitney coordinates a wide range of inter-service activity, Air Force, Navy, Army, and Marines, to launch the final amphibious attack. Netherlands Marines move in by assault boat, while UK Marines in Wessex helicopters overfly the beach to land behind the defenders.
that the first beachhead assured, heavy tanks and support equipment can move in. In this same fleet are U.S. Navy amphibious warfare ships, from which marine units can drive their armored carriers directly into the sea, onto the shore, over the beach, and beyond. the Allied troops move inland, their progress is communicated to headquarters, here to Sakur, on a visual display unit that shows him the availability of all ships, aircraft and troops. Dispersing a force of this size, built up from so many national components, is a complicated operation in its own right. Sacklant signs the index, end of exercise signal, that will release thousands of service men and women back to dozens of different bases and routines in their own countries. Like many NATO ships, the German destroyer Karlsruhe is invited to Amsterdam. At Eymuden, entrance to the port of Amsterdam, teamwork units slip in one behind the next. Ships headed to moorings in the heart of the city, their crews to a night out on the town. For these men and women from nine nations who for two weeks have worked together in this unique international venture, teamwork ends with a last look at Allied ships lit overall in the harbor of Amsterdam. 
evidence of NATO's will to continue keeping the peace by an adequate system of joint defense.